Thanks, Jim. And thanks to the other organizers for the invitation. It is a real pleasure to be back, not the least because the question of how animal cultures and human cultures are related or might be related has been an interest of mine dating back to when I was a graduate student here at UCSD and taking classes with Jim. And the work that I'm going to describe today on vocal dialects in the yellow naped Amazon started at that time and has continued to be one of the foci of my research to this day. Like uh, all the speakers so far today, I feel it's important to define what I mean by culture, but since my definitions aren't particularly different than those that have gone before, and indeed uh, Susan is one of the authors of the definition of tradition, I'm not going to belabor the point other than to point out the importance of social learning and to point out that my particular interest today is going to be in traditions that are produced by vocal learning, that is, uh, the learning of the vocal communication repertoire from others. Now, we humans tend to think of vocal learning as common because we, in a few relatively well-studied tacks, rely heavily on it. And it's interesting that although it is certainly widespread, it is absolutely not ubiquitous. There are lots and lots of groups among uh, mammals and birds that do not have it. Those that do uh, include, of course, humans and the cetaceans that we'll hear about later. There's also recent evidence that uh, bats and elephants are capable of some forms of vocal learning. Uh, but it's not as clear that our non-human primate relatives uh, either are capable of learning or are capable of it, certainly not to the extent that humans are. And of course, these uh, groups are very phylogenetically distantly related, and there are lots of groups that are close relatives uh, within mammals that are not closely related. Uh, likewise, in birds, we see a similar pattern. So the Ossian songbirds, uh, like this robin here, rely on uh, vocal learning to learn songs. But their closest relatives, the sub ossian songbirds, uh, for the most part, don't seem to do that. There are reports of learning in hummingbirds, and of course, parrots are well known for their vocal learning ability. And again, the most parsimonious explanation in both mammals and birds is that vocal learning has evolved independently multiple times. Now, one common manifestation of vocal learning or uh, vocal tra are vocal traditions that are known as dialects. So these are very common, uh, they described in taxa with vocal learning. They, in birds, they've been a uh, focus of active research dating back to Marler and Tamura's article in 1964 in Science in which they described vocal dialects in the male song of white-crowned sparrows. So here are uh, six calls, uh, songs, sorry, recorded up north of San Francisco Bay in the Marin County area, and they're all very similar in structure. These are spectrograms here with time along the x-axis and frequency along the waveform. So this is the frequency patterning of the call itself. Here are six uh, songs recorded in Berkeley, and they're very different from six songs recorded south of the bay in uh, Sunset Beach. Despite an extensive amount of research over the last 45 years, many questions still remain uh, relatively poorly understood about dialects, including uh, how do they arise in the first place, uh, and why are they seen in some taxa and not others, what contributes to the persistence and stability of dialects in some taxa, and in other taxa, why do dialects seem to evolve or change uh, on some temporal time scale. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, what, if any, are the benefits to individuals of conforming to these vocal traditions. Uh, my research is focused on parrots, and I uh, had a long slide to tell you why, but actually Susan did my work for me. When she described uh, taxa that might be interesting to look at for vocal traditions, I think she went through many of these characteristics that are exhibited by parrots. Of course, there are lots of them, and that makes it nice for comparative work. They forage widely for different seeds and fruits through the landscape. They're long-lived, large-brained, socially complex, with a hierarchical social system in which mated pairs are maintained through time, often very long periods, years. And these are maintained within flocks and flocks joining into night roosts in a hierarchical system. Um, Although I should point out that uh, the, the degree to which these associations at these different levels are permanent versus fluid is relatively poorly characterized, for, well, is beginning to be well characterized for only a handful of species. And finally, of course, they have extensive vocal learning. Uh, from captivity, we know that parrots of both sexes are capable of mimicry, and this mimicry is lifelong. And so this has driven my study of parrots in the wild, and I've been particularly interested in this species here, the yellow-naped Amazon, which is a champion mimic in captivity. 
In the wild, the yellow-naped Amazon is found in the same tropical dry forest of uh, Central America that the capuchin monkeys are found in. I don't know if this is a coincidence or not. Um, <laughs> So here in the yellow shading are the dry forest habitats in Costa Rica, and this is uh, the same areas where Susan was showing that her study sites are. Here's a parrot's eye view of the tropical dry forest in Santa Rosa, one of the study sites where we work. Uh, you can see that this is at the transition from the wet season, which, during which trees are very well leafed, to the dry season when many trees lose their leaves and it becomes easier to see green parrots and follow them around. It's even easier to see them in the agricultural areas surrounding these regenerating forests. This, uh, in general, this habitat was cleared for forests uh, certainly over the last two centuries. But the parrots are doing pretty well in this habitat. In fact, they prefer to nest in isolated trees in, that have been left for shade in cattle pastures. Uh, I suspect that they're doing this in order to avoid predation by a number of predators, including uh, capuchin monkeys. So the nest sites are used year after year, and that provides one nice locus for trying to study interactions between different parrots. Another one are uh, these night roosts. So here, it's dark, so it's hard to see the parrots at night, but they're clustered up along the very top edge of this tree. These roosts can uh, include up to 200 or 300 birds at their peak size, and birds will disperse outward from these to forage uh, during the day and to attend nests. These roosts also occur in highly traditional locations. By this I mean that the birds will come back to roost in the same trees night after night and in the same general area year after year. And this provides a very convenient way to survey populations for geographic variation. So in 1994, when I was beginning my PhD, I conducted this sort of ethnographic survey and recorded vocalizations at each of these 22 roosts spanning the range of the yellow-naped Amazon in Costa Rica. And when I started my survey, I have to say that I was initially rather disappointed by the results. I was expecting there to be strong differences between these very obvious night roosts. But in fact, I didn't find them. So here again are spectrograms and on the bottom uh, waveforms, time and the amplitude of the sound over time. And what we've got are six different contact calls. These are calls used very commonly by parrots while moving, uh, flying, or just uh, perched within the landscape. And we've got two different calls from each of two individuals at three different roosts. And when I play these, let's see how my thumb <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to the ear, they sound very similar. They all sound like wah-wahs to us, right? Uh, well, when I continued my survey and moved south, actually closer to uh, Loma Barbadol, we found very different style of contact call. So here, rather than the two-syllable wah-wah, we have a relatively uh, long, constant frequency introduction, then a sharp upward-downward modulation that sounds like wuleep. So again, we've got uh, calls from six different individuals. As I continued my survey up on the northern border of uh, Costa Rica with Nicaragua, I found a third dialect here represented at one roost. This in structurally and to our ear has some similarities to the contact call found in the south, but it's separated by 60 kilometers. You can play this. And finally, at uh, some roosts bordering the north and south dialect, we found some individuals that were bilingual. That is, they actually used both neighboring dialects interchangeably. So here are the contact calls now from a single individual calling first the uh, northern wawa and then a southern weep call. So as you can hear, these are very distinctly one or the other type. They're not intermediates between these two different types. And so when we map these out uh, on these roosts, we find the classic mosaic dialect pattern. That is fairly constant form of a contact call and then sharp shifts to another contact call. So the reds here are all south dialect. The blues are all north dialect. The green is the one Nicaraguan dialect. These red diamonds indicate roosts at, some, uh, roost at which some individuals were bilingual, but these were relatively rare. Only about 10 to 15 percent of birds at any one roost would be bilingual, and most of the birds here use the southern dialect. Later, uh, after publishing this, we found that there was another roost here, just to the north, at which most individuals use the north dialect, but there were a few bilingual individuals. So the border is really quite sharp between these two different dialects. 
we quantified this variation. So we didn't just uh, listen to the spectrograms, we quantified it using a technique called spectrographic cross-correlation, which is nice because it gives a single measure of overall call similarity. And when we map this out using multidimensional scaling here, each point represents the average calls of an individual, and the proximity between those points represents its similarity. And you can see that they group out ni quite nicely. Here are all the Nicaraguan calls, here are the northern calls, and here are the southern calls. If you're looking very closely, you can see that there's some symbols that appear in both. These are actually bilingual in, uh, birds giving either northern type calls or southern type calls. And, uh, to test the strength of this clustering pattern, we used Mantel test for matrix correlation, where we took our call similarity matrix, so all the pairwise comparisons of calls, and tested it against a matrix in which we had ones for comparisons between the same dialect and zeros for comparisons between different dialects, found a very strongly significant correlation between call similarity and the dialect structure. Not surprising, we can hear this with our own ears. We also found, looking within dialects, though, that there was some structuring by roost. So within the northern dialect and within the southern dialect, there's a significant association of call structure by roost, although this structure is much more subtle. It's the fine structure within these changes in note types. So yellow-naped Amazons exhibit contact call dialects, much like uh, white-crowned sparrows exhibit uh, in their male song. One question I then wanted to ask was, were these really stable geographic phenomena uh, that were consistent over population, and indeed they were. So we went back and resurveyed these sites in 2005 over an 11 year span, and as you go through this, and I think we can play each one, you'll see that they sound very similar to our ear. And indeed, uh, if we go back even farther to calls recorded by Gary Stiles in 1982, we can hear similar calls as well. So over uh, almost a 20-year span then, 20, sorry, 23-year span, we can see that the dialect structure appears to be very similar. And when, when we map it out, sorry, yep, we can see that uh, the borders appear to be very similar as well. So here's 1994, I already showed you. Here's 2005. And while there's a little bit of change in the presence or absence of bilingual birds at this border, the border is, is virtually in the same place. A little change up here at the Nicaraguan border where we hadn't seen bilingual birds before. There now were bilingual birds here. We found a new roost at which there were bilingual birds and there's some northern birds up here where before they were just Nicaraguan. But overall, a picture of stability in dialect form and in stability in the dialect borders. So why? Why do we see these sorts of stable uh, population level phenomenon? Why do we not see mixing of the different dialect types? Why do we not see change or loss of dialect form? Well, we can basically break the hypothesis down into two classes. One that, that suggests that there's limited dispersal of movement of individuals between different dialects. If, if the dialects don't mix at all, then there's no possibility of them changing. And this could be either through physical barriers or simply because the birds aren't welcome when they move from one dialect to another. Alternatively, there could be vocal convergence and learning going on. Birds may move from one dialect to another, but learn the new dialect when they arrive. And they could, might do this for a number of reasons, to get access to social groups, to actually form the pair bonds and mate, or perhaps to gain knowledge about distribution of resources that might be popping in and out at various times of the year. So we've addressed these hypotheses using two different techniques that make some nice strong predictions for what we expect to see. One is population genetics. We'd, if there's no dispersal between, of individuals between dialects, we expect to see um, excess genetic differences forming between dialects. That is, excess, uh, genetic differences in excess of what would be expected on the basis of distance alone. On the other hand, if birds are moving back and forth and mixing their genes, we don't expect to see genetic differences, but we do expect that vocal convergence will occur after movement. So we expect to see the learning that we think is underlying this entire system. So in order to do genetics, you need to collect genetic samples. And this is not necessarily always easy with parrots. The, they're smart birds, and they tend to laugh at the traditional style of catching birds, which is misnetting. Uh, luckily, 
they are, do nest in cavities, and they nest in the same cavities year after year, and we can find these cavities. And if those cavities aren't right, right next to the cavities occupied by killer bees, then we can climb up to them and collect chicks for sampling. And so that's, yeah, they're really cute, aren't they? Uh, that's where we uh, collect most of our samples is from chicks, which have the benefit of knowing where that individual started its life. And so we've uh, addressed this with two uh, different genetic markers, one with mitochondrial DNA sequences from the control region, and another uh, later study with microsatellites. Uh, and in both cases, we had sampling across uh, one dialect boundary, two different dialects. The results are very similar for both. In neither case do we see any evidence of genetic structuring along dialect lines. So here on the left is a uh, mitochondrial phylogeny, if you will, of different individuals. And individuals are coded by blue if they belong to the north and red if they belong to the south. So it looks like there's some split here, but these are all genetically identical individuals sharing the same haplotype. And as you go through the tree, you can see that any individual's closest genetic relative may be an individual <laughs> from another dialect. And any individual's closest geographic relative, so here's a North D individual and here's another North D individual, and they're on different clades of the tree, so they're genetically quite distinct. Likewise, when you look at uh, genetic distances between pairs of individuals, the pairs, the genetic distances based on microsatellites are no greater for pairs drawn from two different dialects than they are if they're a pair drawn from the same dialect, whether that be the North dialect or the South dialect. So the genetics suggest that there's lots of gene flow and lots of movement of individuals. Uh, my student Alejandro Salinas Melgoza has been doing a very difficult experiment now to try to confirm whether uh, vocal convergence could be underlying then the uh, maintenance of these dialects through time. And what he's doing is capturing birds using giant canopy mist nets and then moving them. And we either, uh, we radio collar them and then either move them across dialect boundaries into a new dialect or we move them an equivalent distance within the same dialect or we have same site controls that we just release at the same sites. We then have them radio collared, we monitor their social behavior, and we record their vocalizations. And our predictions are not just that birds will match the new call of the new group, but we also thought that social affiliation may be underlying this, and that social affiliation would increase after convergence. Well, again, initially our results were rather uh, not disappointing, but certainly not in the direction we expected. Uh, the controls that we moved within the north dialect, we didn't see any changes. So if they gave a north call before, they gave a north call afterwards. And this was true of, of a whole lot of birds. In the south, we moved birds from the north, uh, sorry, from the south to the north. Most of these birds also did not change their dialects. In fact, where we could continue uh, monitoring them, we found that many of them returned back to their original capture site 30 or 40 kilometers away. However, we did have one individual who showed the expected pattern of vocal convergence, or predicted pattern. So this individual was a juvenile that started with a South dialect, and after six weeks was giving a very credible imitation of a North dialect call. When we look at patterns of uh, social affiliation between these birds, we see some interesting patterns here. The non-convergent birds tended to stick with other South dialect birds that we had released into the flock. So that's the green bars here in weeks post-release. Uh, very few of them hung with north dialect birds only, which is the, the red bars. In contrast, the bird that did converge very quickly joined a, a north dialect group, stayed with that group. But this, interestingly, this uh, social affiliation preceded by several weeks any evidence of call matching. So call matching was not prerequisite to being able to join that social group. So to summarize then, uh, Yellow-naped Amazons have stable vocal traditions as seen in songbirds and certainly in humans as well. These dialects are likely maintained by vocal convergence by immigrants, but that is not necessarily an easy process. And we're not, still not clear on exactly what the selection pressures are that promote learned convergence. And so I'm going to end now just with these questions that I think uh, we'll carry on to tomorrow that we can ask about vocal traditions. What determines the stability and scale? What are the benefits of these sorts of vocal traditions? What constrains them? What sort of mechanisms may be underlying their acquisition? And what sort of commonalities we see between the vocal traditions of birds and humans? And I'll end there. Thank you.